that's it. Here we are, Fisky number eight. Let's get rolling. Uh, we have uh, academic freedom, privilege, and intersectionality, revisiting a core ethical requirement of transparent and open research in, in the contemporary academy. This is Dan O'Donnell. He partnered with me and Stephanie Hackstrom in putting together a proposal for UCLA Library to become a partner in putting on Fisky six years ago. So he's been in this room negotiating with a librarian to make this happen. So he's a legend. He's got a, a couple of Fisky awards. So um, let's hear it for him. Dan O'Donnell. Marty, we're going to stop this at 42. I mean, yes. Great. Okay. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, having heard about, uh, you know, the need for um, community and that we should really enjoy ourselves. Um, I thought, why don't we talk about racism and sexism? Then? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be giving a, it, there is something actually important to say about that, but I'm going to be talking about academic freedom. Um, it's an interesting thing to be talking about at Fisky in particular, because uh, so many of the participants in Fisky, as opposed to, for instance, a uh, an academic conference, are in publishing uh, at the Federal Reserve, um, perhaps in some cases in libraries where uh, faculty or librarians are not faculty and may or may not have uh, full academic freedom. But it nevertheless is something that undermines or uh, undermines underlies a fair bit of uh, the research that we publish and that uh, and the issues and also the places where um, academia and research often comes into the strongest contact with the broader society. So it's a, an issue that's of particular interest, um, given the theme of this year's Fisky. Before I go on, um, I'm going to just mention a couple of things. Like I said, this is a, 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 I've been a union leader for about the last 10 years as well in academia. And uh, as part of that, had to defend a number of academic freedom cases and defend people from uh, defenses of academic freedom cases. And one of the things to keep in mind is academic freedom cases are never about researchers looking into how cute puppies are. Uh, it's always about uh, issues that are of great emotion, uh, of issues that... Um, uh, many times, awful people doing awful things. Uh, in other cases, uh, people doing uh, necessary but uh, work that others consider awful. I'm not going to be going into too much of the detail of this because uh, the basic argument uh, that I'm going to be presenting is that I think we live in a time where we're going to have to revisit certain things. There's a historical moment going on. So I'm going to be revisiting oh, one other thing to say about this. Uh, I looked up as one does nowadays. What should you do when you're giving a keynote to ChatGPT and Gemini? And they both said, congratulations, you're giving a keynote. This is based on your previous work. Uh, you should find a space of consensus where people can then move forward. So I decided, let's talk about sexism, racism, <laughs> inequality, and why don't we do it with a new project that I'm just beginning. Uh, so this is, in fact, the very first talk that I'm giving on this topic in an academic context as opposed to a union context. Uh, and it, it does mark what is, um, I put in my first grant application for this, but I'm just starting a, a, a new project on this. So I'm going to be talking about how uh, academic freedom uh, does or does not protect free inquiry in the advancement of knowledge. And I'm a humanist, and some of you may have heard me say this before, that scientists solve problems and humanists problematize solutions. So I know enough uh, to put square quotes around at least some of those in some contexts. But I'm going to be looking at it from a very practical perspective. Uh, and it's informed of my experience in the library in the classroom as a as a scholar, uh, but also as a, a member of the academic labor movement um, who has had to justify uh, defenses of academic freedom, uh, both publicly and uh, to members of my own faculty association. And as a practicing academic today, I'm subject to the same zeitgeist as I'm going to argue as the rest of us. I'm also going to say, and this is unavoidable, this is a fairly America and Canada centric discussion. And that's because academic freedom varies in how it's understood from country to country and region to region. But the issues that I'm talking about are broader than that. But uh, the devil is sometimes in the details. And in this particular case, I'm going to be talking about that. 
And because it is North American centric, uh, um, it's fairly text heavy. Um, and the reason for that is for people who aren't necessarily familiar with some of these debates, uh, you, you, I may skip over something where you're thinking, wait a second, what did he just say? So there's going to be three major parts of this. The first is the problem. What's wrong with academic freedom? Uh, or why do we need to reconsider it? The second is the history and current form of academic freedom. That actually comes a fair bit uh, later in the talk. And then finally, last slide or two, uh, not particularly detailed what needs to change. There's no what and needs to change and how does it need to change because I'm not 100% sure of what the answer is to that yet. Um, and what I'm doing right now is just flagging the problems. So the problem is that uh, academic freedom discussions at the moment, well, through time, go through periods of great concern and then periods of quiescence. Um, the concern tends to happen when something has changed and then everybody starts debating what kind of freedoms are needed. And the quiescence comes after we reach a consensus and then it falls down to the individual people who are not talking about how cute puppies are. Um, so the the three major periods, uh, there are others, but three major periods to look at is the really the importation of the research university to North America from Germany. And with that, the idea of academic freedom, um, uh, which comes across uh, with free freedoms, but adopts a North American kind of uh, perspective. The second is the transition from primarily sectarian colleges uh, to non-sectarian universities. Um, and that's throughout the 19th and first half of the 20th century. Uh, and then a very, very important period is, seems bizarre to say this, but the moment when there was a shortage of faculty members in the 1960s, uh, the, the time of the seller's market, um, which in fact is when uh, our, the last serious revisiting of academic freedom took place. Um, and then, as I said, there's generally quiescence when uh, a new consensus is reached. And then the, the degree to which we discuss academic freedom tends to be about individual cases. Is this person should be fired or not? Uh, but not broader discussions of this. And I would say the most recent period of quiescence in North America has been through the 70s into the maybe mid 90s uh, is when it started up again. So we're now in a period of grave concern. Um, it's been most noticeable in the last 15 years uh, with debates largely about deplatforming on campus and about student safety. I should actually flag something here. I'm going to be using terms like woke, deplatforming, safety, and I'm just going to be using them the way that people use them. I'm not commenting on whether or not wokeism is a good thing or a bad thing or even a thing. I'm not going to be commenting on whether or not deplatforming is a thing. I'm just, this is the nature of the debate that's going on right now. And it tended certainly about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, to revolve around a number of people um, who I'm beginning to call performative academic freedom uh, people. Um, Jordan Peterson's an example of one of them. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos is another. In Canada, we have Francis Widowson, who just um, caused or created the last circumstance in which I had to mediate these things. Uh, Eric and Nicholas Christakis, that's the, the Yale costume controversy, some of you may remember. Um, but in retrospect, we can see it starting about 30 years ago uh, in the mid 90s with, for example, the rise of trigger warnings on syllabi in North America. Uh, the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, uh, put out a statement on that. I'm, I'm going to be quoting from actually in a bit. Um, the reason why I don't think this has been seen, and I don't think it has been seen as a moment of reevaluation of what academic freedom is, is because the fault lines have aligned so closely with especially U.S. political polarization. And that is to say that the, and now I'm going to be using a kind of right-wing approach to this, the rise of wokeism was clearly what the people who were uh, approaching this on the right were against. And so as a result, it was seen to be evidence of, for instance, groupthink on campus, of a left-wing takeover on campus. Um, and it wasn't seen as being necessarily a crisis in academic freedom. Um, in the last couple of years, though, that's changed. 
and both sides are beginning to feel where the shoe pinches. Uh, the conflict in the Middle East, going back now the last 10 months in particular, has ended up where, in fact, we're seeing, uh, I'm going to say both sides, but many different sides complaining that they feel unsafe on campus, uh, feeling that there needs to be restrictions on what can be said, and also feeling that people have the right then to say things that are shocking or aggressive. Uh, again, both sides. Um, and we've also seen this in the U.S., uh, uh, particularly with the rise of specific interpretations or the ban on specific interpretations or facts. So, uh, for instance, or, or approaches to discovering uh, or making research. So bans on the use of critical race theory, bans on approaches to teaching racial history in the U.S. In Canada, we've seen uh, generally right-wing governments imposing freedom of speech codes on universities in both Quebec and Alberta until about 10 months ago when it turned out uh, that actually everybody should say whatever they want was not what they meant. And so the rules have changed again in the last couple of months. So it's been rising and falling with political uh, uh, changes, but it's only now that it's both sides are feeling this that I think we're really seeing the fall. So I'm calling this a period of concern because the issues go beyond who's involved or what they're saying. And it goes to the bigger issue of what's allowed. So Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard, who recently resigned, she didn't resign from the presidency at Harvard in response to her response to a specific case of a specific individual in an academic freedom case. Where the pressure came on her, and, and let's say one of the places where the pressure came on her, there's other ways you can read her resignation, but at least one of the ostensible places where pressure came, including from her own statement, was that she was unable to formulate on the spot at Congress an appropriate philosophy of what is protected by academic freedom at Harvard or not. So again, it wasn't because somebody did something, it was because she couldn't actually on the spot come up with what she and others considered to be a suitable definition. Just uh, last week, I was reading in The Guardian that there's a law coming in in Israel uh, to, or at least there's a discussion of a law in Israel to limit academic freedom for professors who are, quote, supporting terrorism. But it's not being promoted by specific cases, it's being promoted to create ground rules given the current situation there. And the protests, I, I, I'm actually not 100% sure how it's been going in the States, but in Canada, there's been a lot of campus protests where one of the main uh, 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 demands has been that universities stop academic exchanges with Israeli universities. And this is not happening again because of any abuse in any one specific case. This is a debate about what the limits of academic freedom should be. So maybe we can solve things later on, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm not planning to solve the Middle East, uh, the rise of political polarization or generation gaps. I mean, we can take a stab at it, but uh, I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, and, but I'm also not gonna say suck it up. Uh, I'm not gonna argue that academic freedom is bigger than all of us and our problems, and that all we need to do is to learn uh, to deal with unpleasant matters. And that actually was the approach uh, the last time the laws uh, and the rules were written about this. And I'm gonna give you a couple of quotes. Uh, I won't read them all, but uh, this is a quote from uh, Galbraith uh, in 1967 at Berkeley as part of the free speech and academic freedom. And uh, Galbraith was saying that good universities have always been places of convention and dispute. The best uh, have been places of the most energetic and uninhibited contention. And in case you just think that means lots of arguments, it's no. Uh, no one is so silly as to suppose that there's such a thing as an orderly, well-regulated debate, which can be carefully tailored in advance to the taste of the audience and the prejudice of the censors. Core universities are composed of craven men and inevitably very orderly places, and bad universities have this silence and tranquility of the desert. Um, there's some truth in that, but the thing to watch is the talk about uh, uninhibitedness. And this is the AAUP statement on trigger warnings from 1994. Trigger warning, in case you're not aware, is a statement that says, for example, some readers, uh, some students may find some of the content of this book objectionable or uh, harmful or may cause them, um, you know, to feel unsafe. Uh, they started rising in the mid 90s. Um, and so uh, this is from the AUP on a campus that is free and open. No idea can be banned or forbidden. No viewpoint message may be deemed so hateful or disturbing that it may not be expressed. 
Uh, Institute of Higher Learning fails to fulfill its mission, its mission if it asserts the power to prescribe ideas. And racial or ethnic slurs, sexist epithets, or homophobic insults almost always express ideas, however repugnant. Um, and if you prescribe any ideas, including those, you've done a disservice to your mission. And the statement contains something else that I think shows why we're in this period of concern, because this is now 30 years ago, and this was a reasonable position to take 30 years ago. Uh, it is, by definition, the consensus of the American Association of University Professors Committee A, that is the, the main group responsible for defending academic freedom. Um, and it recommends that in response to verbal assaults, and, the, and remember, they're talking about putting a warning on a statement that says some of you may find this book objectionable. <laughs> Uh, in response to verbal assaults and the use of hateful languages, some campuses have felt it necessary to forbid expression of racist, sexist, homophobic, or ethnically demeaning speech. Individuals and groups that have been victims of such expression feel an uh, understandable rage. Uh, they claim that the academic progress of minority and majority alike may suffer if fears, tensions, and conflicts spawned by slurs and insults create an environment inimical to learning. These arguments, grounded in the need to foster an atmosphere of respectful and of welcoming to all persons, strike a deeply responsive chord. But while we can acknowledge both the weight of these concerns and the thoughtfulness of those persuaded for the need for regulation, rules that ban or publish speech based on its content cannot be justified. I don't think you would phrase something like that nowadays um, in a conference thing, but I want to talk about the there, the, you can see the change coming in what I think is, in fact, a major change in how we understand uh, communication in science. And so this is where I think the root of our problem lies. It's the inability of current academic freedom rules to live up to and address the, quote, deeply responsive chord that the AUP saw coming in 1994, but felt that could not be dealt with by academic freedom. And they're not the only group that sees this. Mikhail Horn, in a huge study of the history of academic freedom in Canada, discusses, in fact, objections to unfettered academic freedom from the point of view of members of what he calls visible minorities, uh, who feel that it makes the uh, uh, scholarly environment uninviting. And then he says, but obviously we can't restrict speech to make places inviting. It, it just, the concept can't, he, he sees it coming, but he can't get his head around it. And so as I'm gonna show the debate that the AUP is pointing to is way bigger than even what they recognize at the time. So the really important thing here is to realize how much everything has changed since 1962 and 1970, when these rules were put in, the, the current definitions of academic freedom were put in place. The Canadian uh, CAUT rules were in the early 70s, um, but they're part of that same, that same process. Uh, so when these were put in place, uh, you had um, the, the main focus of anti-racism, uh, anti-misogyny efforts at the time were really focused on this idea of the liberal subject. And they understood racism and misogyny and all the other isms as really being a, a, a pathology, an individual pathology that if only we could address, as Martin Luther King put it, their children would not be judged by the color of their skin. And in fact, if at the time you argued that a community has distinct needs and reacts in distinct ways, well, that's the way the sheriff in, in the heat of the night talks. Uh, the idea that you could see structural racism, structural sexism was in fact what racists said. So at the time when these were put in place, the idea was to free up individuals to conquer individual uh, expressions of racism. Almost immediately after that, we started getting research that shows that that's not true. Uh, so one of the very first set of this was research in the early 70s uh, on how classrooms could be made better for girls. Again, we may forget this now because women so outperform uh, men in both grade schools and high schools and post-secondary, but that wasn't true in the early 1970s. And in fact, the research at that time showed that it was the classroom nature was what was holding women back. If you intervened in how you taught, you could create a class that was more welcoming for the participation of women and others. 
The most famous work on this is by Sadker and Sadker. They published in 1994, but the work was 20 years in the making, and, and they have lots of other articles on that. Uh, you also had studies in education about the impact of the lack of role models for women and members of equity deserving groups. So an example is Malcolm and Brown. I believe that one's about the impact of role models on black female scientists. Um, and you had studies at the beginning, uh, things about what uh, Macintosh calls the knapsack of privilege, how privilege changes the shape of a room and how people who enjoy that privilege and that currency both reinscribe it, but also are not necessarily able to understand how people who don't share that privilege are able to interact in the room. And this work was part of a larger movement that focused on the change from the liberal subject, that is to say the needs of the free individual to engage in conversation, to the discussion of the structures that prevent members of equity deserving groups from sharing in that privilege. Uh, early studies of uh, female silence and, for instance, the novels of Henry Miller or Orientalism from Said, uh, published in 1978. Uh, Millet's published in 1970, an unbelievable takedown of uh, Henry Miller. Um, and that goes right through the developments in critical race theory and the understandings of uh, structural racism from Crenshaw and critical race theory. So at this point, you might be thinking, boy, this has become really specialized and very North American. Uh, the sources that I'm citing uh, and the approach that I'm describing to understand privilege comes out of the U.S. by and large, um, and it is responding to this country's racial history. And it's also often stood by others to be very American. So I know from setting up Fisky, uh, the Fisky conferences between Europe and North America, when we first introduced conference codes, for example, that was understood to be a very American thing. And, and I've had that in other organizations that I've, I've been part of. But in fact, that's increasingly becoming a, a shared understanding. Um, I think the manifestations of Me Too across, for instance, Western Europe uh, initially were seen as a very American understanding, but in fact gradually became uh, internalized and localized. And it's become a fairly standard uh, part of our daily academic lives. You had a slide at the very beginning that explained the conference code of conduct. Nobody stopped out of the room. Um, I've been under many of these things over the years, and I've yet to see a debate be stifled because I'm not allowed to yell at anybody. Um, and we generally try to avoid mails, uh, male-only panels, for example. I've not been on a conference that hasn't thought about demographic diversity and its keynote speakers and its panelists uh, in 15 years. And that's, that's not just North America, that's around the world. So that brings me back to where the concern lies, because if you go back to my initial list of people and the issues that I think have been bellwethers of this problem, people like Peterson, Yiannopoulos, and Widowson, and problems like the current situation in the Middle East, you realize that these are by and large not associated with peer review publications or classroom behavior. Uh, in fact, these are all involved in what we call in North American academic freedom, extramural academic freedom. And that is to say the right of, in, of academics to engage in extramural public discussion. So I do have to do a slight discursus here on academic freedom uh, in North America. There are three kinds. It's different from the German. Uh, in Germany, the three traditional kinds of academic freedom are freedom of research, freedom of teaching, and freedom of learning. Uh, North Americans are smart enough to know you don't want that last one. Uh, students have to be English majors the way I say they have to be English majors, not the way they want to be English majors. Madness. Um, and so in North America, because we still like triads, we decided, well, we got to have another one. Why don't we have uh, extramural speech? That's not actually how that gun went. But at any rate, so we have these three. Um, and the other thing to do now, this is a particular Canadian way of understanding uh, academic freedom. It's actually not an American way, but it is true, even in America. Uh, in America, academic freedom is essentially enforced uh, through accreditation process and by the AAUP. In Canada, academic freedom is part of contract law. So every university has a different academic freedom uh, and you negotiate for it. But in actual practice, the Canadian understanding is not wrong because academic freedom is not free speech. Free speech is the right to be a crank and take whatever happens to you. Academic freedom is the right to defend yourself against the charge you are a crank uh, and keep your job. And so academic freedom is really about whether or not you get fired. <laughs> 
Uh, so the freedom of research means your employer can't discipline you or fire you for pursuing a project and publishing your results as long as you obey all the legal, safety, ethical, and financial concerns of the institution, and you meet scientific standards and quality control processes. You don't have the right just to ask for 10 pages in uh, science or nature, uh, and you also don't have the right to submit fraudulent work, uh, and then when you're caught out, say, academic freedom now, um, both of those cases override your academic freedom. And we need this because otherwise we can't challenge consensus or pursue important research questions and share or build on the results. I got Galileo down there, but uh, there's been many, many cases of people pursuing uh, results that people have said are crazy uh, and, and have nevertheless pursued and done. There's also been horrific examples of people pursuing uh, results that are fraudulent and dangerous and used academic freedom, at least partially to protect themselves. Freedom of teaching, your employer can't discipline or fire you for teaching a particular subject matter in a particular way, as long as you obey institutional policies and programs. For example, you have to, in the end, reduce student performance to grades. Uh, you're not allowed to say, I don't, I don't personally believe in grades, but that's too bad. I have to submit grades. And in Canada, it's certainly case law that if you do not, you can be fired. Academic freedom doesn't extend that far. I also can't decide I'm going to teach physics 1000 instead of English 1000. Uh, I have to teach within the major and I have to teach the courses that I'm assigned. I once did kind of do something like that. I was given too many first year courses and not enough old English courses. So I told the dean that I felt that every first year English student needed to learn old English. Um, but uh, that was a good faith argument. Um, and so as a result, was protected by academic freedom. And also he backed down. Um, and I have ethical, legal, and contractual concerns about what I can do there. This used to be the Wild West. It used to be there was basically nothing that you could do about professors who taught whatever the hell they wanted to, whoever, however, but that's changed. Uh, I know from my father talking about stories in the 60s of how people taught in classes, uh, you know, there wouldn't be many departments if we taught that way nowadays. Uh, and we need this because otherwise we can't fulfill our duty to bring students the most advanced research based knowledge. And we also can't we need to be able to encourage students to challenge disciplinary consensus. So then there's freedom of extramural expression. And that means your employer can't discipline or fire you for engaging in public discussion on anything, anywhere, anytime. Period. Unless you violate hate laws or something, but even then it's not clear they can fire you, it just means you go to jail. Um, and so the only constraints are legal and political. You can come under a lot of pressure if you push something too hard. And there's three arguments for this, and it's very interesting why we have this. The first argument, and this is actually the key one in the history of this right, is it demonstrates the employer's commitment to the other two. That is to say, the feeling is if your employer is policing your speech, when you talk in the newspaper, write a letter in the newspaper, that, can't, that employer can't be trusted not to leave your research and your teaching alone. That's actually the main argument for this freedom. The second is it's necessary to allow in, uh, criticism of internal policies and processes. I'm an English professor. I'm not a management professor. Um, if I think that an associate dean's up to no good, I have to be able to call that out as my role as part of the community. But I am not an specialist in academic associate deanism. And so as a result, I have to be able to talk about things that I don't know much about. And academics have historically had a public role and disciplinary relevance is really hard to police. So I'm an English professor. I'm talking about the philosophy uh, of the last 20 years in terms of the move from the subject, the liberal, uh, the liberal subject to a more structural understanding of intersubjectivity. And I'm kind of drawing on that from Millet and her takedown of Henry Miller um, and from Said and his discussion of Orientalism. I think I've got something to contribute, but I'm not a specialist in the history of philosophy of the 20th century or any of those topics. And so it's felt that we need to be able to move. And so when this right was first, so when this right was first defined in 1915, 1925, it was revisited and then 1940, again by the American Association of University Professors, it was understood to be a contingent right based on professional performance. Uh, that is to say, 
you had to be free as a citizen it, in it states that interacts with First Amendment jurisprudence, uh, but you have to be free from institutional censorship or discipline, but your special permit, uh, position as an academic but public intellectual imposes obligations, and you should be at all times accurate, exercise appropriate restraint, show respect for the opinions of others, and you could be fired if your extramural expression ex uh, caused there to be grave doubts about your fitness for continuing service. Uh, this was revisited in 1962 after a really great case, uh, not for the person involved, but for the rest of us, um, at the University of Illinois from a professor of biology who encouraged students to engage vigorously in fornication. Um, and this was felt to be beyond the pale, and so he was fired. Uh, there, it raised grave doubts as to his fitness to be a professor of biology. And so the American, the AAUP met, and they also had grave doubts about this guy. <laughs> but in the end, they decided that maybe he hadn't really said it quite as vigorously. <laughs> they, they sort of were wondering about whether or not he'd been truly vigorous in his defense of fornication. Um, and so in the end, they said he probably shouldn't have been fired, but they revisited the matter as the 60s went on. Uh, as you can imagine, the summer of love probably called a lot of their thinking into uh, question here. And by 1970, they decided, in fact, they changed it. And this on the right there is what they came up with. It's a note on the 1941, which reverses it. And it says that the controlling principle is that a faculty member's expression cannot constitute grounds for dismissal unless it clearly demonstrates your unfitness to serve, and they rarely bear upon your fitness, and if you're ever going to be judged on that, it needs to be in the context of your entire career. So basically making it almost impossible uh, to fire people for this. So this brings me to my final point, because this is where the rub is. When the new rules on academic freedom uh, extra, uh, extramural were passed, the focus was still in the mid-60s free speech time on ensuring the freedom of the liberal subject because they're simply, I, I, in Canada, I think it was 6 or 7% of professors were women at the time. It was basically a white male environment and people simply did not think that there was any kind of intersubjective uh, issue. Uh, racism, sexism were all thought to be personal vices rather than structural problems. And nobody realized the degree, or very few people realized the degree to which biases and privileges were structural and that privilege could be reinscribed. Since then, in our other two academic freedoms, we've adapted without changing the language. We have conference codes of conduct, no problem. Trigger warnings are a dime a dozen. Uh, we generally, I mean, this doesn't mean that conferences are magical safe spaces where privilege doesn't exist, but we're aware of this as we do it. But our extramural uh, freedom, particularly the way it's phrased by the AAUP, which has been adopted by the Canadian Association of University Teachers, is explicitly designed to prevent that adaptation. It, you have to clearly demonstrate an unfitness to serve, and it has to be on the entire record. And so it's still the case that we can acknowledge the weight of these concerns and the thoughtfulness of those persuaded that the need for regulation, all those people who feel excluded, but rules that ban or publish speech based on that content simply cannot be justified. That is a reinscription of pr uh, privilege, and it's still the one we have. And so this is where I have to stop, though, because I don't know the answer. As a union leader, I'm extremely aware of how collegiality policies at universities are used to police speech, and they're not used to police the speech of the associate deans. They're used to police the speech of the people the university wants rid of. And there's a great collection by Duke Ballerstadt, and I don't know how to say this last name, I should have looked it up, Bhattachara, in 2021, that faculty on the margins are particularly subject to policing. So, for example, Arthur Butz, who's an engineering professor at Northwestern uh, and a vigorous Holocaust denier, has been denying the Holocaust for about 30 years, but apparently teaches a mean first-year engineering course. And so in the context of his entire stuff, what can we do? Salita uh, had some intemperate tweets about the Middle East and was refused tenure. Uh, we have a dean in uh, uh, the University of Toronto who was censored by CAT for much less than that, uh, had views on Palestine that a donor didn't like. 
So it tends to not be people like me that get censored like this, unless it is in my capacity as a union president, but I'm not going to be censored as a white male English professor. But at the same time, our current approach to extramural expression is harming academia. It's not supported by academics themselves. I can tell you I've defended some really horrific cases on campus and people say to me, why are you defending that person? Um, it does allow external intervention. Governments are coming in saying you must have free speech codes. You cannot teach critical race theory. And above all, it affects the academic freedom of equity deserving groups by excluding them from discussion. We talk about the heckler's veto, but we don't talk about the privilege veto which stops the academic freedom of others in the room. So my projects to address this, I don't really know what to do, except I think the Canadian approach is, of course, <laughs> uh, is seeing it as a contractual right is one. Um, and as I've said, I think one way of seeing this is that free speech is the right to be a crank, but academic freedom is the right to defend yourself against the charge you are a crank. But if it turns out you are, well, maybe we don't need you teaching engineering. Thanks.